Many times the amount of DNA that you're trying to detect is too low to do that. And that's where you need PCR. PCR to amplify your DNA of interest. But wait a minute. Why is it? Why can we use PCR in order to determine the ratio of DNA in two samples? Well, I think that needs some explanation because I don't think you can take this for granted. But let's have a look what will happen using PCR. Here's the coordinate system. And the y-axis reflects the amount of your specific DNA and the x-axis in this case reflects the number of PCR cycles, C4 cycles. So let's assume you're doing the amplification for one, two, or three cycles. Well, what will happen? You got one sample and that's sample B that contains one copy of your DNA of interest and you got another sample, that's sample number A, that's got four samples and if I just label the amounts of DNA that accumulate I could keep going with number 8 I could keep going with number 16 so if I now follow these samples as they accumulate what you will get is that some sample number A, sample A, in the first cycle will be amplified to 8 molecules, in the second round will be amplified to 16 molecules, sample B will be amplified from 1 to 2 molecules, in the second cycle it will become 4 molecules, and in the third cycle it will be 8 uh, molecules, right? So, this is what you get, and now listen carefully because now I'm making a very important point and the point is that the ratio between those samples the ratio in the amount of DNA that has been amplified will be maintained over the PCR so the initial ratio is 4 to 1 so the ratio is 4 A divided by B is 4 now if you go to the first PCR cycle, you have been doubling both of them. And so your ratio is 8 over 2, it's still 4. And with the next PCR cycle, you have again uh, done a doubling of both samples. So now it's 16 copies and 4 copies of the DNA. And that again will result in a ratio of 4. So just based on that, based on the fact that the ratio of the DNA that is contained within your samples allows you to use PCR to, to determine and quantitate the ratio between samples. So, if you now stop the reaction, let me just draw this in red, if you now stop the reaction here at cycle number two in this case in the reality it will be more cycles but, but now for the sake of simplicity I tell you that it's two cycles what you can do based on this information is now to put your PCR product on a gel so again it's a regular agarose gel and what you have done by amplifying the DNA is to bring it up to an amount that you can detect by simple ethidium bromide staining. And now hopefully you will see a strong band for your sample A and you will hopefully again see a weaker band in your sample B. And all in all you could be very happy because you now have solved the problem. You now have determined the ratio between your original samples. You learned that this ratio is being maintained through PCR amplification and it's 
basically because in both cases with each cycle you will double the amounts and if you double two amounts of DNA the ratio will be maintained so that's the good news however there's always a catch and that is shown here the problem indicated here is the following even if you start amplifying your initial sample A you will double it and with the next cycle you will double it again you will sooner or later find out that you no longer double it but only amplify it to a weaker extent and ultimately you won't amplify it anymore at all and if you do the same with your sample B containing in this example just one molecule yes you double the amount with each cycle initially probably you are still doubling it here but at some point again no more doubling will occur and ultimately you will again reach a constant amount of PCR cycles uh, of PCR product no matter how many cycles you will then still do why is that? well it's a phenomenon that we call saturation you see up here is saturation so what's saturation? what's the reason behind that? why wouldn't I get exponential amplification all the time? Well, here is why. What you do initially is you start with a very low amount of template DNA and you blow this apart to allow primers to bind here. And your primers are in high excess whereas the PCR products are present in a very low concentration make it kinetically almost impossible that after being denatured they would find each other again. But that changes once PCR goes on further. Now after the next denaturation step at, 82 de at 92 degrees or so you will have lots of your single stranded PCR product. So guess what will happen in many cases? In many cases it won't really be the primer that would first bind to your PCR product. Instead, the PCR products will find each other like that. So what you will get is hybridization of the entire PCR products to each other. And this will no longer allow the primers to bind here. If, even if they do bind somehow, they will still have a hard time performing the polymerization then because the polymerization will be blocked by the opposing strand annealed to your template. So at some point, PCR will be saturated because the PCR products will bind to each other no longer allowing sufficient primer binding and primer extension. That's basically the reason why we see this phenomenon of saturation. So should we care about this? Well, yes, we should. Because just imagine what we will see on our gel. Now, having PCR allowed to go for a few more, more cycles, perhaps our sample A will now provide us with an even stronger band reflecting quite a lot of PCR product but our sample B will now look just the same and also in sample number B we will have reached saturation so the amount of PCR product is very similar if not the same and so this no longer allows us to calculate the initial ratio of samples so what can we do about that? Well, what we need to do is to catch the PCR products early on in a phase where on the one hand the 
samples containing a higher amount of DNA did not yet reach saturation, did not yet go up here. Whereas on the other hand, the samples that have our template in low amounts will already have been amplified to the point where we can actually detect them, because otherwise we won't see them on our gel again. So how can we come up with such a situation? How can we find the right PCR cycle? Well, if you really have no quantitative real-time PCR machine available, the best you can do is to first set up a PCR mix with sample A and sample B and then add all you need, your template, your primers, your buffer, your enzyme, everything and then take those PCR mixes here and distribute them to a couple of tubes, each of them, like that or like that, or like that. So from this sample, you take a quarter, put it in this tube, you take another quarter, put it on this tube, and you take some, put it in this tube, and take some, put it in this tube, and you do the same with your sample B. You also distribute this to those little empty tubes. And what you do next is, oh, you put all of these tubes into the PCR machine, conventional PCR machines now, and then you take your PCR tubes then out of the conventional PCR machine after different numbers of cycles. So you take the first pair of tubes out at 15 cycles, and you take the next pair of tubes out after 20 cycles, another pair of tubes you take out after 25 cycles, and another pair of tubes you take out after 30 cycles. And if you then take these samples and put them each on a gel, after the 15 cycles typically you can't see anything because you did not yet reach an amount that you can see on a gel. After 20 cycles perhaps your sample A but not your sample B, will have reached a detectable band. At 25 cycles, this band is probably stronger and you will probably also start seeing your sample, the band resulting from sample number B. And at 30 cycles, typically, they will all have reached uh, saturation. So if you then use those kind of tubes, you can make some educated guess of what the ratio of template DNA in your sample A versus temple, sample B will have been. But as you can tell, even from this little example, is that it's a very tedious procedure and that in each case you have to do many trials or to do many attempts in order to find out which number of cycles is right to allow you detection on the one hand, but not to go into saturation on the other hand. And only then you can tell what the ratio might have been. So it's a very tedious procedure and it's also a very error-prone uh, procedure because usually, usually once you can even see the band, you have already reached saturation at least to some extent. You no longer exponentially amplify your sample. And with that in mind, I would like to sort of disqualify this as poor man's PCR, something that you just need to do if you have no better choice, but if possible and by any means, it's by far preferable to use something that I'd like to call real-time PCR. So the next video will then start covering real-time PCR in more detail. Thank you very much.